Welcome to this latest edition in our video interview series here at iConnect called Five Questions. Five questions that we ask to a scholar of public law about his or her research. In this case, his research. My name is Richard Albert, and along with Tom Ginsberg and David Landau, I'm a founding co-editor of this blog, iConnect. Our guest for today in Five Questions is Oren Doyle, professor of law at Trinity College, Dublin. A dear friend of Icon S, of iConnect, of the entire family of Icon programs, journals, conferences. Wonderful to have you here, Oren. Thanks for agreeing to do this. Glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation, Richard. So, Oren, as you know, we have five questions that we ask of a public law scholar. So let's just dive in. And I'm looking very much forward to our conversation about your, your work. So, Oren, what are you researching and writing right now? Yeah, so I think at the moment, really working on two things. So with my colleague, Rachel Walsh from the, from the Law School in Trinity, um, we're working on a couple of articles around constitutional amendment and deliberative democracy. Um, so together we were constitutional law advisors to the Citizens' Assembly in Ireland that explored the issue of abortion about two, three years ago. And building on our experience of that, we're exploring how you can integrate these new sort of citizens assemblies, deliberative mini publics, as the political scientists call them, into constitutional amendment processes. And we've sort of been exploring that from a, a couple of different directions, whether they might be helpful as a guard against populism, the extent to which they can enhance the democratic, democratic character of constitutional amendment processes themselves. So I think it's found it interesting from the deliberative democracy side, but it's also forced me to think again about some of the values that underpin constitutional amendment processes and how they can work better. So that's the one thing that I'm working on at the moment. And the other is starting to look more at issues of territory and how law relates to space, to physical space, and the role that constitutions play in creating, managing, regulating that relationship between law and space. So I've done a, a bit of writing on that over the past few years and a bit of thinking, and that's sort of probably in the medium term, the, the direction in which my research is headed. And so how and when do you write, Oren? Do you have a strict schedule that you follow, or do you just write whenever the the mood strikes you? Um, so I tend to, so, sort of when it strikes me, I'm more of a morning person. Um, so, you know, I write at the, at the start of my working day and currently on a research sabbatical. So I have little other distraction apart from writing. Um, so after I get up and I have my breakfast and my brain gets into gear, then I start writing. It's actually like a, a fairly normal working day, um, like following normal hours. When I have other commitments as well, so when I'm teaching or when I have administrative commitments, um, I try to build in days for writing. So I try to concentrate my teaching and my admin commitments on a couple of days a week and leave the other days free for writing. I find place very important to me for when I write. Um, so I like to be in places where I'm not distracted by other things. So I used to find my office a very distracting place for writing because I associated my office with having to do administrative work, for example. Uh, so this no longer works in this, this lockdown period that we're in, but I would do a lot of writing in coffee shops and places like that. The, the noise and the bustle doesn't distract me and actually I find it you know, quite a good place to work, whereas the sort of place where you're meant to be able to work like your office, I do find distracting. So that's, that's just me, I guess. Mm. And so you've been a member of a faculty now for a number of years. When did you know that this was the career that you, you wanted to have? Yes, yeah, so I, um, I think that's a question with an answer in two parts. Um, so I suppose I was an undergrad law student in Ireland. And as I um, went through that, I think I started my degree thinking you know, I wanted to be a practicing lawyer and I wanted to be an advocate in court and um, doing a law degree was a way to get there, but I wasn't expecting to find it that interesting. And then I just became more and more interested in the law and the discussion of principles and theory around it um, as my degree went along. And this was that sort of natural, then well, I went and did a master's, I came back and did a PhD program and that sort of naturally led 
sort of just evolved towards becoming an academic. But also for the first nine years or so that I was an academic, I was also practicing as a barrister in Dublin. So I was doing two things at the same time. Barristers are self-employed, so you're not particularly busy at the start. Um, then though after about sort of six, seven years of that, I was realizing that I much preferred the academic side to the practicing side and took a decision to actually give up practice and become an academic in its entirety. So yeah, so got this inkling relatively early on and then sort of solidified later when I decided to focus exclusively on academia. Let's uh, talk a bit about your time as a student whether an undergraduate or a graduate level student. Can you think back to the readings that you did at the time to whether there was an article or a book that you first encountered as a student that today continues to be important in how you think about the law, how you approach your scholarship, uh, either or both? Um, yes, yeah, so I was giving a bit of thought to this question. Um, in advance, because I was on notice of some of the questions you might ask me. I've seen I've seen these things before. Um, um, you don't know to have a new question to ask you this time. Well, I'll see how we cope. Um, I'll improvise. But the yeah, actually, I think Concept of Law by HLA Hart was a book that I um, did on my jurisprudence course as an undergraduate, and. I think in, in two ways it has been particularly important for me. It's maybe a, a strange one to pick because Hart wasn't particularly thinking about constitutions, certainly in the way that you would think of them outside the UK, um, as they have these master text documents. But I think there were, it sort of um, led me to accept this broadly legal positivist way of thinking about the law of trying to, to distinguish between um, accounts of what the law is and your views of what the law should be. And I found that helpful to me in constitutional law where a lot of what we're dealing with is very normative, but to be able to think about normative things in a non-normative way, in a more conceptual way, and to divide the conceptual analysis and the critical normative analysis, I found helpful. And I think that probably goes back to, to Hart's book um, for me. And then as well, his talk about ultimate rules of recognition and how legal systems come into being in the first place. And that, I think, is a concern that I just keep on coming back to in different ways. So my current work on territory that I was talking about earlier is again a sense of, well, how does a legal system come into existence? How do we know what the laws are in a particular place? So I think, um, yeah, that book, even though it's not a book that I find myself referring to that frequently, has both sort of fundamentally set my take on the subject and also has sort of given me just a, this recurring itch around a certain set of questions that I keep coming back to. Hmm. Well, here's a question, Oren, that I haven't yet asked in this, in this series, um, but I think it's, it's important to ask, and I think it could be useful to our viewers insofar as many uh, are current students in law, whether undergraduate law students or graduate law students. So you've told us about a book that uh, you encountered first in law school um, that continues to be important to you. Whether or not you reference it today, it has shaped the way you think about law, the way you approach your scholarship. That's precisely the kind of uh, answer that I was hoping to get because it's really uh, an answer about how you think about the law. Is there a book, Oren, that you did not encounter in law school that you wish you had and that you would recommend to law students today to make sure they have a look at before they graduate? Hmm. Um, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not showing myself to be so good at this improvisation. Am I? Um, well, we can take it under yeah. advisement. Maybe, uh, maybe you can send me a note or something and I'll put it in in the post that I uh, publish on iConnect. But it's an interesting question, isn't it? Because we read so much in law school mm. and yet we graduate and we think, well, sometimes we think, I wish I would have read this as a law student. Yeah, so I think maybe, so these were things I did my postgraduate study in America um, where we did quite a bit of, quite a few courses that were touching on work by critical legal theorists. Um, of some of, of Roberto Unger's work. So I'm not going to specify a particular book, but I think it is um, 
important for students? I think a lot of what students are taught through law school is implicitly law is a good thing. Mm. Um, there are taught ways of rationalizing the law's response to social situations so that <clears throat> when they're out with their friends or their family and the family say, oh, the law's done this, it's stupid. As a law student, you're sort of trying to say, no, it's not stupid because it does this and that. Um, and I think it's important to counteract that somewhat, to have a more critical perspective on what the law is doing. So I think if you're a law student and you're not encountering reading that is fundamentally critical of our notions of law and legal systems, um, then you're missing out on something. And it could be coming from various different perspectives, and I don't want to reduce these to just being criticisms, but it could be from a feminist perspective. The, a lot of good work done on the feminist judgment projects is a particularly good book on that in the Irish and Northern Irish context. It could be from race, critical race theory. It could be from the older sort of critical legal studies movement within the US. But I think to be exposed to something like that, that challenges the presuppositions of the way in which law is often taught. This may have sort of over 25 years ago since I started my law degree, so this is probably, this has permeated undergraduate curriculums more than it had back then. But I think as a student, if you're not coming across those sorts of work, you know, you should, you should go out and find them and, and read them. Mm, that's a useful answer, Oren. Thank you for that. Uh, my own answer, as you've been speaking, I've been thinking to myself, well, what would my answer have been? Uh, and I didn't read Carl Schmitt's constitutional theory until after my JD. Uh, and I wish I had read it very carefully as an undergraduate law student getting my JD. It's an interesting choice. Well, given the times, yes? Yep, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's, it's a very interesting book. Yeah, that is another book that I've come, through, come to more lately. Um, and it's, yeah, it's provocative. And there's a lot of interesting analysis in that that's appropriate for... Um, um, yeah, I think, I think for constitutional lawyers, const students of constitutional law in particular, to think about. So we come out like constitutions typically start with, you know, we the people make this constitution, we give it to ourselves. And then we sort of glide over that onto the structure of state, um, structure of government, fundamental rights and so on. But drawing attention back to those questions, how does it happen that this constitution is made? And Schmidt has a set of answers to that that you need to grapple with. So I'd, um, I concur with your recommendation. That's right. They may not be the right answers, but they yep. are answers that we have to confront. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Oren, for that. So you've published a lot. I'm familiar with your works intimately. Um, if you could pick one among all of your works, your articles, chapters and books, uh, books, which is, would you say is the dearest, maybe most important to you, so that I can share a link to this work of yours for our readers to get to know a bit more about you if they don't already know about your work. And tell us also why it's your favorite or most important or dearest work. Yes, on. I think I can be a little bit fickle about things like this, but I tend to like things that I've finished relatively recently. Um, so I think currently my favorite would be a book that I did for the Harsh Constitutional Systems of the World series. So it's the, the Constitution of Ireland. It happened to be lying around the apartment here, so I even have a copy that I can show. Um, what a beautiful cover. It has, a, it has a nice cover, which is one of the reasons I like it. I always, when choosing a book, put a lot of store by its cover. I know that goes against conventional advice, but a good cover is important. The story around the cover is sort of interesting. The artist Puttichat, um reads a couple of chapters of the book in draft form, and she puts together the sort of montages of, of different images that occur to her as she reads the book. And, you don't know what's going to come out of it, but she says, I'm thinking of this and I'm thinking of that. And I made a few suggestions and then that's what the cover became. Um, I sort of, the reason I'm choosing it um, is that I've worked as a constitutional lawyer, like an academic constitutional lawyer within Ireland. And as all of us do, I think that we start within our own jurisdictions and we learn how to make the sort of arguments that lawyers get to make before courts. And it's a particular way of doing things. Then over the last sort of five, seven years or so, I've moved more into comparative constitutional law where you're drawn to this outsider perspective 
across a number of systems, maybe as you theorize about them. Um, and this book sort of gave me an opportunity to look back in at the Irish legal system. So not to write it in the way that I'd write a book for Irish legal practitioners or Irish law students who need to learn the law, which is really important. So not diminishing that in any way, but instead to, to write about it as it might appear to a non-lawyer within Ireland or to somebody looking at compared to constitutional lawyer, looking in at Ireland, picking out big trends, trying to capture you know, where things might go. I think there's a, the, the one certainty is that everything is going to change. And I think there can be a tendency uh, within law to think that, you know, we're, we'll be forever stuck at the moment we're currently in. Whereas when you zoom back out, you can get a sense, you know, things have been changing over the past 70, 80 years. There's been noticeable trends and you get a sense of where the next trend might go. So it was an opportunity to take a very different perspective on something that I've been thinking about in different ways for many years. So that's why, that's why I enjoyed writing that book and I'm choosing it as my favorite. Oh, well, thanks for sharing that with us. And, uh, and I can confirm that it's a, it's a very good book, an important book. Uh, in fact, so important, Oren, uh, that I've commissioned two reviews of the book, uh, one here at iConnect and another at the American Journal of Comparative Law. So I very much hope that people will be able to get their hands on, on the book uh, and soon. It's very reasonably priced, I should say. Well, Oren, thank you so very much for spending time with us uh, today, uh, talking about how you research, what you write, uh, and also some recollections from your, your education uh, in law. Thank you so very much. Okay. Thank you, Richard.